please be seated and turn with me now in God's Word to Genesis chapter 30, and starting in verse 25. And again, these are larger sections, but it's very good that we go through all this and understand what God is revealing to us, showing again his people, warts and all, to encourage us, but most of all to encourage us about his sovereign faithfulness. And so it's on page 29 here. We'll begin reading at verse 25, and we'll go to verse 16 uh, of the following chapter. As it came to pass, when Rachel had borne Joseph, that Jacob said to Laban, Send me away, that I may go to my place and to my country. Give me my wives and my children, for whom I have served you, and let me go. For you know my service which I have done for you. And Laban said to him, Please stay. If I have found favor in your eyes, for I have learned by experience that the Lord has blessed me for your sake. Then he said, Name your wages, and I will give it. So Jacob said to him, You know how I have served you, and how your livestock has been with me. For what you had before I came was little, and it has increased to a great amount. The Lord has blessed you since my coming, and now when shall I also provide for my own house? And so he said, What shall I give you? Jacob said, You shall not give me anything. If you will do this thing for me, I will again feed and keep your flocks. Let me pass through all your flock today, removing all there, the, the speckled and spotted sheep and all the brown ones among the lambs and the spotted and the speckled among the goats, and these shall be my wages. So my righteousness will answer for me in the time to come when the subject of my wages comes before you. Everyone that is not speckled and spotted among the goats and brown among the lambs will be considered stolen if it is with me. And Laban said, oh, that it were according to your word. So he removed, so he, that's Laban by the way, he removed that day the male goats that were speckled and spotted, all the female goats that were speckled and spotted, every one that had some white in it, and all the brown ones among the lambs, and gave them into the hands of his sons. Then he put three days' journey between himself and Jacob, and Jacob fed the rest of Laban's flocks. Now Jacob took for himself the rods of green poplar and the almond and chestnut trees, peeled white strips in them, and exposed the white which was in the rods. And the rods which had been peeled he set before the flocks in the gutters and the water troughs where the flocks came to drink, so that they should conceive when they came to drink. And so the flocks conceived before the rods, and the flocks uh, brought forth streaked, speckled, and spotted. Then Jacob separated the lambs and made the flocks face towards the streaked and all the brown in the flock of Laban. But he put his own flocks by themselves and did not put them with Laban's flock. And it came to pass, whenever the stronger livestock conceived, that Jacob placed the rods before the eyes of the livestock in the gutters, and that they might conceive among the rods. But when the flocks were feeble, he did not put them in, so that the feebler were Laban's and the stronger were Jacob's. Thus the man became exceedingly prosperous and had large flocks, female and male servants and camels and donkeys. Now Jacob heard the word of Laban's son, saying, Jacob has taken away all that, are, uh, that was our father's, and from what our fa uh, was our father's he has acquired all of his wealth. And Jacob saw the countenance of Laban, and indeed it was not favorable towards him as before. Then the Lord said to Jacob, Return to the land of your fathers and to your family, and I will be with you. So Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah to the field to his flock and said to them, I see your father's countenance, that it's not favorable towards me as before, but the God of my father has been with me. And you know that with all my might I have served your father, yet your father has deceived me and changed my wages ten times, but God did not allow him to hurt me. If he said thus, the speckled shall be your wages, then all the flocks were speckled. And if he said thus, the, speck, the streaks shall be your wages, then all the flocks were streaked. So God has taken away the livestock of your father and given them to me. And it happened at the time when the flocks conceived, and that I lifted up my eyes and saw in a dream, and behold, the rams which leaped upon the flocks were streaked, speckled, gray, spotted. Then the angel of God spoke to me in a dream, saying, Jacob, and I said, here I am. And he said, lift up your eyes now. See all the rams which leap on a flocks or streaks, speckled, gray spotted, for I have seen all that Laban is doing to you. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed the pillar and where you, where you made a vow to me. Now arise, get out of this land and return to the land of your family. Then Rachel and Leah answered and said to him, is there still any portion or of an inheritance for us in our father's house? Are we not considered strangers by him? For he has sold us and also completely consumed our money. For all these riches which God has taken from our father are really ours and our children's. Now then, whatever God has said to you, do it. 
and the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Well, brothers and sisters in Christ, we so easily forget our life is under the sovereign care of God. He's the one directing even those things we think of as incidental, like a lot being cast in a lap. He's directing those things for his glory and the good of his people. God's testifying to that even here in this passage. That's why we can't live like the world, but, but we should live working hard and with confident faith in God. Knowing what the psalmist even testifies to us in Psalm 127, that unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain. Who build it? Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchmen stay awake in vain. And then so what we have here is this testimony of God's sure word that he is perfectly at work in an infinite number of ways. Even when we face what seems like insurmountable problems and even problem people, he is at work in our life. You know, we have to confess there's a lot of things in our life that don't make any sense. And yet behind all of that, God is in his wisdom, in infinite wisdom, ruling and overruling, doing what is beautiful and glorious. Hannah Moore, who not too long ago was nicknamed a powerhouse in a petticoat. She was a writer, she wrote poetry, and she had a great deal of wealth, which actually she gave uh, as a Christian to help men like John Newton, who wrote Amazing Grace, and William Wilberforce to abolish, she helped them to abolish the evil African slave trade in Great Britain. Well, one day she walked into a carpet store, Charles Spurgeon tells this story, and she saw the strands, the, the tangled threads and the knots on the backside of the carpet. And she looked at the carpet maker and said, there is no beauty here. The carpet maker replied, she says, Miss Moore, you're only looking at one side of the carpet. And he took her to the other with its beautiful pattern. And, and she realized and she responded, that's a beautiful image of God's providence in our lives. This is written here to show and to remind us of, uh, that, that God's providence really is beautiful as he sovereignly weaves everything in our lives and the lives of his chosen people all to fulfill fill his plan of redemption ultimately in Christ his son. And that same sovereign hand which was at work in the ugliness and the sinfulness of Jacob's life all to bless him by grace is at work in your and my life today too as believers. And so what we're going to look at today particularly is as we see God's sovereign kindness and love. We need to remember he, he's at work in our troubles. He, he's at work in our labors. And all of this really should and must drive us to give thanks to God. At this point in Jacob's life, he had already, he, he'd already worked seven years to marry Rachel, but Laban deceitfully switched in Leah. And then Jacob married Rachel with the agreement to work another seven, year, seven years. So this is 14 years later. And during that time, Jacob fathered 11 sons and at least one daughter. And, and now that Joseph is born, the firstborn of Rachel, and the debt is paid, Jacob asked Laban in verse 25, he says, send me away that I may go to my own place and to my own country. See, Jacob has not forgotten God's promise to him at Bethel to bless him, to give him the land of Canaan. And this brings us now, as we look at this text, to see how, how we can never forget God is sovereign over that which troubles us. Jacob is saying, let me go, having pretty much become a slave to his deceitful and greedy uncle Laban. Laban kind of tries to encourage him to say, stay because Laban's going to lose a lot of money with Jacob going. He, he literally says in the Hebrew, it's I have found by divination 
that the Lord has blessed me for your sake. Divination or seeking omens, by the way, is forbidden by God. Even though our society enjoys doing that, sad to say. But look at Leviticus 19.26 and Deuteronomy 18.10, and it's an abomination to God. But deceitfully, Laban is, is kind of acting like, well, you know, I, I didn't know why I was... Things were going well, uh, but, you know, I, I found out, and, and these things kind of pointed to the fact that God's blessed me because of you, Jacob. See, Laban really wants his blessing to continue. But working for Laban had not been easy. In, ver in chapter 31, verse 7, Jacob tells his wives, your father has deceived me. He's changed my wages ten times. You know, we, we struggle sometimes with bosses. Or his bosses, we struggle with employees. It would be much worse to work for Laban. He's changed my wages ten times, but God did not allow him to hurt me. See, God's sovereignty is what makes the difference in your and my life. Even wicked unbelievers will see uh, God's hand and, and, and be forced to admit it and even enjoy some of the benefits. I mean, didn't God promise Abraham? He says, I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. When Abraham was, was appealing on behalf of Sodom, did, didn't God say he would not destroy Sodom if there were ten believers there? Start thinking about our nation in this context as well. Because this nation has been blessed because of the many Christians before us. And it's because of Christians today that God has withheld his harsh hand of judgment despite how we are in the death spiral of Romans 1. Embracing those things that God says he despises. We call them good. We make him the center of our entertainment. And yet God often deals mercifully, even with the worst pagans, because of his people. And that's what we see here with Jacob. And that's why we, even when somebody is, is mistreating you, somebody is, 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 is doing terrible things to you, what does God say? What does Jesus command? To bless those who spitefully use us. We're called to do that. It doesn't mean we, we roll over and let them take advantage of us, but, but we don't, or what I should say what we do realize is that vengeance is God's, not ours. The Lord will repay. Because God is working. He's protecting us. And at times, he works also to humble us through those trials as well, to turn us from our sin, to turn us to his mercy. Because Psalm 130 says, there is, mercy, or there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. And, and in this tough situation, Jacob is being forced by God's plan to hate the deception he used to practice. He's even having a taste of what the scripture says later in the Psalms, that because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the most high, your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you. God's been protecting him. See, that, that's an encouragement. That God will bless you and I as his people, as we trust him, as we live the life of faith, even as we face difficult people and situations. Can't we look back on our lives? I know I can, and, and look at some terrible times in my life. And now that I look back, and I didn't understand how I was going to survive another minute. And yet I look back, and I say, oh, that was for my good when the disciples were at the cross of Jesus. Didn't it seem that all was lost? And, and yet when Jesus rose from the dead, it proved everything was, that happened was for the eternal salvation of God's people, even you and I. All because God is sovereignly in control, just as he promises. Now secondly, as we look at this text, and we're just doing basically highlighting a certain things, God is sovereign even over our labors. We, we need to remember that. In this fallen world, uh, we know there will always be temptations. There will always be uh, hurdles. In fact, Jesus says, in this world we'll have tribulation. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And that includes in, in your and my daily labors. 
Now, admittedly, Deuteronomy 15, 13 will later command a master not to send a servant away empty-handed, but here's the tight-fisted Laban who wants Jacob to stay or at least let him leave only if he was penniless. Jacob even says so in the next chapter. But Laban, again, as deceitful as he is, tries to play nice and, and tells Jacob in verse 28, name your wages and I will give it. Jacob's not looking to live a life of ease, but to provide for his family. And that's right, for 1 Timothy tells us, if anyone does not provide for his own, especially of those of his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Now, I know many of you have raised sheep and you have a pretty good idea of what's happening here, because normally sheep and goats are one color. In fact, we... Uh, the, the flock of over 200 that I helped a man keep, I mean, he always wanted a pure white sheep. And so here's Jacob. He comes and, and promises to again feed and keep Laban's flock for what will be another six years, and his wages will be speckled and striped to the livestock. I mean, this is going to make it easy, isn't it? To see that Jacob is not tricking Laban. In fact, he even says in verse 33, so my righteousness will answer for me in the time to come. Now, just kind of put this in context here, because uh, what Jacob is asking for, basically, is 5% of the flock. That's roughly what it is. But actually, they found ancient contracts from this time, which showed it was pretty common for shepherds to ask to receive 20% of the flock. Now, pause for a moment. Because here's Jacob, this former deceiver who tried to grab all that he could. And he is now trusting God. He, he's remembering God's promise to him to make him prosper. And he's trusting God will be faithful and will bless him even with little in Jacob's hands. And he's also acting with scrupulous integrity. I mean, this is a huge change. Why is this important? I know we're all used to the phrase, you can't teach an old dog new tricks, right? The reality is here is this 90-year-old man, roughly. And the God who gives a new heart, who transforms hearts, has humbled Jacob. Now that's why we as Christians should never and can never say, don't ask me to change or I can never change. Why? Because that's a denial of the Christian faith, the power of God. And while Christians and, and non-Christians, I see even too, non-Christians I should say, as well as Christians will still sin, hopefully the Lord will help us to sin less, but, but the truth is, by the work of the Holy Spirit who works faith, our triune God is changing and sanctifying us day by day. <coughs> He's using the situations in our life, the difficulties and difficult bosses or difficult employees. And, but what the sanctifying means is that he's going to work repentance and the hating of sin. That's going to mark the Christian life more and more. That's why a Christian parent who loses their temper with their spouse or the children can and must repent and ask for forgiveness because they fail to love them. It's why you kids can repent. And say, Mom and Dad, forgive me for talking back. Or not respecting you like I should. Or honoring you. In both of these situations, and in all of our sins, we must look at God's word and prayerfully seek the grace of repentance and the change of heart that God alone and God can give. But here's again Laban who knows the price of everything and the value of nothing, who doesn't seem like he can lose here, and he jumps at this deal. But Laban, in verse 35, also tries to secure Jacob's failure. Uh, Jacob had said, I'm going to go through the flock, and Laban says, no, no, I'm going to beat you to it. And he separates those, those speckled and striped flocks, so, so Jacob can't have them in his presence. And now Jacob is still struggling with his sinfulness, even as we do as believers, and until the Lord calls us to himself, we're going to do that. But Jacob tries to encourage the speckling and stripling by by putting sticks in front of the flocks. Well, I studied genetics in college, and that has nothing to do with how flocks reproduce. 
this teaches us something else. Because we can sinfully think the same way as Jacob was here. But we do it in a different way. If, if we're having a good week, we can sit there and think, well, you know, uh, God certainly is going to be pleased with me. Look, look, I've obeyed him here and here and here. Forgetting the holiness of God, forgetting how God is, is angry with the wicked at all sin. Forgetting that the only reason God accepts you and I, or blesses you and I, it blesses our labor even, is for the sake of another. Remember, God blessed Laban because of another, because of Jacob. God blesses you and I with salvation because of another, because of Jesus. He blesses our labor, ultimately too, because of Jesus. No, admittedly, God gave Jacob wisdom as well. He, he, he's wise in taking the strongest and the healthiest. He breeds them together. And this text, text makes it clear, though, it was not Jacob's craftiness, but the hand of God's blessing at work. Because God provides. Even, and, and even can make us thrive, even when others mistreat us. Here, verse 43, we read thus. I mean, here he's taking care of just the sheep and the goat. And all of a sudden, we read this. The man, that's Jacob, became exceedingly prosperous and had large flocks and female and male servants and camels and donkeys. God was blessing him far beyond what he could imagine. Now, lastly, we can never forget God's sovereignty should make us thankful. And we see that as well here in this text. But you might say, well, I don't see Jacob giving thanks. You know, as Jacob became wealthier, chapter 31, verse 2, shows Laban's countenance was not favorable to Jacob. Even his sons were getting bitter uh, that, that God was fulfilling his promise to prosper and make Jacob a great nation. But, but now look at this, though. In chapter 31, where does Jacob direct his wives? Over and over. In verse 7, he says, God did not allow Laban to hurt him. In verse 9, he says, God has taken away the livestock of your father and given them to me. In verse 11 through 13, Jacob tells his wives the dream God gave him, that the angel of the Lord came to him and said, I have seen all that Laban is doing. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed the pillar, where you made a vow to me. Now arise, get out of this land, and return to the land of your family. And to understand where the thankfulness is here, you have to remember the summary of the Heidelberg Catechism. The second question that summarizes the whole catechism, saying, how many things are necessary for thee to know that thou in this life may live and die happily? It says three things. First, the greatness of my sin and misery. Second, how I am redeemed from all my sin and misery. And the second is, or the third then, is how I am to be thankful to God for such a redemption. Well, in that last part of the catechism, what does that focus on? It focuses on the Ten Commandments, and prayer. It focuses on our obedience to God's commands and praying about everything to him. Well, what's happening here? Well, Jacob is preparing his wives so that they can obey God's command to return to Canaan. Put this in context. If somebody was to give you an incredible gift and then they would ask for a small favor. Would you say no? Give you a brand new truck. If you plow my 20 acres. I don't think too many farmers would, would refuse that. Well, God promised to be the God of Jacob and his descendants. And, and God also promises to be your God. He gives you life, your breath, your daily bread. And through his son, he tells us we are more valuable to him than the birds of the air that he cares for. And he's provided for us forgiveness for our sins, for Christ's sake, and even a blessed eternal life with him. So even if right now you feel, you look at your life, and you say, well, I don't have what I'd like, or, or I have nothing else. Don't you and I still have more than abundant reasons to thank God? To obey Him, to tell others, to look what the Lord has done for me. Don't we have reason to pray to Him? Which is the chief part of thankfulness. 
commit our life to him day by day, even if we failed yesterday. Start again, because God's mercies are new. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I understand, and I want to impress this, and, and these large details and these large chapters show and remind us everywhere that God is sovereign over everything, which is why we're commanded even, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. That passage, in fact, plays a prominent role, and I, I like always drawing your eyes back to this. This person in this book, it's Corey Tim Boom, in the book The Hiding Place. Kind of puts our life in perspective. She and her sister were taken to a concentration camp. And, and I know in our society, we, we honestly have forgotten totally what the concentration camps were. I remember the first time when I was 13 years old going through Dachau, and I spent two days there. I spent those two days with tears in my eyes looking at the absolute brutality and the wickedness of the Nazis. In fact, the person I was with, her grandmother, had gone through Dachau. Well, Ravensbrück was one of the most severe, most overcrowded, and, and, and most uh, the terrible concentration camps. And Corey and, and her sister Betsy were not just sent there, but, but they were sent into the worst barracks, the most overcrowded, the most stinky. And, and by the way, even though I knew that the buildings were all different, I mean, even Dachau to this day has a stench. But they were sent into this barracks. It was stinky and unheated, and, and, and there was only dirty straw as a blanket, and, and, and they had multiple women had to lay on the same bed, and, and, and it was just a terrible place. There was extreme abuse and cruelty that they faced, and, and they turned on each other as well. And Betsy and Corey, one of the first devotions Betsy led in that barracks was on this passage from 1 Thessalonians 5.18, to give thanks in everything, and, and, and Betsy said, we need to start thanking God. But Corey started getting bit by fleas. And, and even though she thanked God for a lot of things, she said, I will never thank God for these fleas. And after studying God's word over and over and being free to do that, they even had some Bibles that they were able to smuggle into there. And the attitude of the barracks changed as, as God worked his gospel truth. Later, a guard was asked, though, to, to come into those barracks and to settle a dispute but they said, there's fleas in there. I'll never go in there. Corey, hearing that, ran to Betsy saying, now I know the reason God sent the fleas, the reason we were able to meet and worship freely, never took our Bibles. They, they never broke them up because God, and she said, God has ordained his little creatures, his little sentinels to keep those guards outside the barracks while we worshiped and spread the gospel. Beloved, God really is sovereign over even the smallest details of our lives. Even those things which, which trouble us. Even our labors. And so look to him and give him thanks no matter what for God's sovereign promise and plan just like in the life of Jacob is to bless his people We'll see that fully in eternity. But he does that even in this life. And he does it all to the glory of his grace. Let's pray. Almighty God and most gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for this word which is profitable and necessary for us. Help us to learn the lessons here, and not the hard way. But we pray that you would humble our hearts and encourage us by your sovereign care. Remind us in every page of your word which reveals your wisdom, your ways and your saving grace and your righteousness through your son and everything in our lives. And by this, teach us to be patient and humble. Most of all, help us to look to your sovereign loving care for blessing and nowhere else. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.